pretty substantially. Hard to come up with a carbonate explanation for that unless I'm precipitating dolomite, which would be great. I could get all kinds of papers published on that. I don't think it's very likely. And then magnesium starts to increase and calcium decreases, and that's a real stretch, until finally we're back into that sort of uh, uh, dual system. So we have a bit of a magnesium problem here and a bit of a calcium problem. One way to figure out what's going on is instead of just looking at the chemistry, is look at the rocks. Scoop up some of that sediment and look at it under a scanning electron microscope and see if we can tell whether it's dissolving or what it's doing. And we've done that. We've collected some of that material and looked at it under the SEM. And this is one example of a micrograph. The bar scale here at the bottom is 10 microns. And you know, I've looked at that picture for 10 years. And I still don't know what it's telling me. I don't know if that example of calcite has dissolved, precipitated, both or neither. Because I don't know what it looked like the day before I grabbed it, and I don't know what it looked like the day before the oil spill happened, and I don't know any, anything about its history. I can't tell what happened to it. So that wasn't a very effective way to do it. Now, you could look at feldspars and maybe get some idea, but the carbonate system is just too reactive. So our grant was running out in three years. We had to get some kind of results. And the way we did that is instead of taking the uh, aquifer material to the lab, is we brought the laboratory back into the field and we did something that we called in situ microcosms, where we took clean chips of pre-characterized reference minerals, the minerals that we were interested in, and put them in microcosms in various parts of the aquifer so that groundwater would flow through these microcosms and allow them to colonize by the microorganisms so we can see which minerals colonize, which minerals react, et cetera. Um, and it, it, which all sounds very good. Actually, the initial purpose of this experiment was something totally different that I won't share with you because, <laughs> but it worked for this other purpose. So, uh, uh, but anyway, so we found that uh, we could by cha uh, changing the amount of time that it was in the aquifer and the place that it was in the aquifer, get an idea of what the microbes were doing. And when we submitted this uh, material for publication to science, we decided that the term porous polyethylene cylinders was a great description of these microcosm containers, much better than small Nalgene bottles with little holes poked in them, which is actually what we used. <laughs> After a year, in the carbonate system. This was fairly a typical picture of what we found of, of dolomite and also a lot of the calcite. This is a micrograph of dolomite. Bar scale at the bottom is 10 microns. Uh, and this red box here is blown up on the right for greater detail. What we found in the dolomite was something that we've termed a macro environment effect. There was no microorganism that colonized the dolomite surface. I'm not altogether sure why, but uh, but there was a lot of evidence of disillusion. The dolomite had these etch pits and etch runnels in it, just like we predicted. Dolomite should be dissolving. A lot of the calcite also looked like this, especially the calcite in the aerobic area up gradient. Some of the calcite was colonized, unlike the dolomite. And where the calcite was colonized, the microorganisms were drilling holes in the calcite surface. We've termed this a microenvironment effect. The microorganism is sitting on this reactive surface, it's producing all these extracellular ligands and CO2 and everything else, and it's dissolving the calcite and making these little holes. And at the bottom of these little holes are these microorganism colonies. Um, and so we've called this this uh, microenvironment effect. Now, we actually found this in a lot of different places. We, we would find this in a well that if we measure the groundwater, or, and looked at the chemistry, we would have said, well, that water is at equilibrium with calcite. Calcite can't be dissolving. Well, we found out that we're wrong, because where that micro, microorganism is colonizing, it's changing the geochemistry. It has nothing to do with what we thought was equilibrium. It's all related to what they thought was equilibrium. Now, in that anaerobic part of the plume, we also found a lot of evidence of not calcite dissolution, but calcite precipitation. Now, I'm going to kind of walk you through this diagram because I think it's sort of a, a picture of how a calcite overgrowth forms. In this uh, picture, we start with a surface of Iceland spar, almost atomically flat 
calcite cleavage surface. And these little bits of calcite are nucleating on that surface and forming these little nubs. And these grow up as these spikes here in this high resolution SEM micrograph that uh, they grow up until they're 0.5 microns high above the average surface of the calcite. And then they stop growing up. They grow out, kind of like the rest of us. And, uh, and they get fatter and fatter, and they form these flat-topped uh, mesas. I'm not really sure why they only grow up 0.5 microns. I would love it if somebody here could enlighten me about that. Um, haven't figured it out yet. At any rate, it seems like these, these nucleate along cleavage or along some other crystallographic control. They tend to form these regular little boxes. And when we first saw this uh, box, these boxes, we thought, aha, microbe corrals, right? The microorganism was on the surface, and it was precipitating calcite around it. It makes these little boxes. But we never actually found a microbe here. We looked really hard, too. We never actually found a microorganism associated with this precipitation. It appears that this is one of these macro environment effects. Microorganism somewhere is perturbing the environment. Calcite is precipitating out. And eventually, these little boxes close up and then form these ridges. And eventually, you get a whole layer formed. And then the next layer starts 0.5 microns high. So why would calcite precipitate? Up till now, I thought I'd probably convinced you that calcite should be dissolving. All this acid is being produced. Well, in that area where we saw calcite precipitating, the dominant reaction that the microorganisms are doing is iron reduction. They're using ferric iron as an electron acceptor. And so whereas calcium is, is dissolving here in the spray, sprayed oil area, iron is dissolving in that very anaerobic area. And here, the concentration of calcium starts to go down a little bit, just like we saw in that cross-section uh, concentration plot. So uh, where uh, there's a real difference between how the iron chemistry looks and how the calcium chemistry looks. So what happens when iron reduction is occurring, when the microorganisms are using ferric iron? Well, we can come up with a, uh, a geochemical equation. And here I'm using benzene as a model hydrocarbon. I know I, I said that benzene shouldn't really be degrading here, but using toluene is a lot messier of an electron equation, and I'm lazy, so I use benzene. And I have a source of ferric iron. And I am going to produce dissolved ferrous iron and a little bit of bicarbonate. Well, this reaction, though, requires me to use a whole lot of proton. And that's a problem. I don't see the pH going up here. And this, this reaction would predict that the pH would go up, I don't know, to 13 or something. Well, I don't see that. I see the pH is staying right around 6.8. So this reaction isn't terribly useful. What we need to do is come up with a reaction that buffers the pH. If we take this uh, model hydrocarbon benzene, a uh, source of ferric iron, and then all this calcium and bicarbonate that we produce just a few meters up gradient, precipitate out calcite, produce dissolved ferrous iron, no change in pH, and this nicely matches what we see. And when we load this into one of those uh, uh, geochemical reaction programs like Freak, when we get the right amount of ferrous iron, we get a pH of 6.8, which is unusually close to what we actually measured. So we reran the calculations because it couldn't have been actually right. So what's my model for the carbonate system? Microorganisms perturb the aquifer environment, both a macroenvironment effect and a microenvironment effect in that aerobic area, dissolve calcite and dolomite. The products of dissolution advect down gradient some distance to where the iron-reducing uh, bacteria are dominating. And in that area, they precipitate out calcite on an uncolonized surface and create these various precipitation uh, features growing up about 0.5 micron above the average calcite surface. Now, in this system, we have not found evidence of microbes actually precipitating the calcite. But that's not to say that it doesn't happen. Uh, a bacterial surface is negatively charged. And a bacteria sitting on a calcite surface will attract positive ions to it, calcium. And it can create this little zone of, of supersaturation and precipitate out calcite. Now, this has been shown in other environments. And it, and it may be you know, in systems that you've looked at 
Uh, we just didn't find any evidence of it at Bemidji. Now, if we go a little bit further down gradient, where oxygen starts to become, uh, starts to get reintroduced to the system, all that iron that we dissolved is precipitating out. It precipitates out very rapidly. And when I've done some uh, column experiments of this, field column experiments, and when that stuff precipitates out, it completely plugs the column. And it's quite likely that it's starting to plug the aquifer material. When it precipitates, it looks kind of like this. This is a micrograph of that iron precipitate. And in here, there's a whole bunch of microorganisms. I'm not sure if the microorganisms are gaining energy from this iron precipitation. They may be. They may also just be caught up in the precipitate, co-precipitated. There's a lot of uh, iron. There's a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of glycocalyx in here. It's a very dense material. And there's also a whole lot of silica. And silica is the next most abundant element after iron in this precipitated material. What's the relationship between silica and iron? Well, just looking at the contour plot, they look remarkably the same. Uh, dissolved silica uh, only increasing in that very anaerobic part. And it looks pretty much the same as the iron. They seem to be behaving about the same. Uh, Cross-section plot, uh, it looks like the um, one of the colors is washing out in the light here. But uh, down here at the bottom is the iron concentration. Iron goes up to about 50, 55 ppm and then decreases very rapidly. And that 50, 55 ppm has been constant for about 10 years. Uh, in the early, uh, ma manganese actually was dissolved out very early on in the first few years of the contaminant, uh, contaminant situation. But the iron has been about the same for about 10 years. Just recently, it seems like it's starting to decrease a little bit, and we may be running out of available iron. It's not really certain yet. In this sort of washed out red here is the magnesium. Magnesium increases, decreases, increases, and then out the back end. And then this is dissolved silica. Dissolved silica increases to about amorphous silica solubility, and then decreases down the back end. The silica does not increase where magnesium increases. It doesn't increase where all the acidity is being produced. It's increasing where it's anaerobic <coughs> and where the iron is being uh, dissolved. Where is the silica coming from? Well, it's not coming from the oil. Again, it's not a particularly important constituent of oil. We would uh, hypothesize that the microorganisms are dissolving silicate minerals. Based on our uh, great knowledge of geochemistry, we would predict that things like olivine would be dissolving very quickly. They're quite soluble. Plagic clays might be dissolving. Uh, microcline shouldn't be dissolving at all. In fact, the, we would calculate these waters actually to be supersaturated with respect to microcline. Quartz can't be dissolving because it's already supersaturated with respect to quartz by about a factor of 10. So we did our microcosm experiments. First hypothesis we have to throw out is that quartz is dissolving. Quartz dissolves about where, in the area where microorganisms are colonizing. Now, it's not dramatic. Quartz is a fairly resistant mineral, and so we don't expect a whole lot to be happening. But we, there's a variety of microorganisms on the quartz surface. And we see this sort of roughening texture of the quartz surface and these little triangular etch pits. It's not terribly clear here. On this high resolution micrograph on the right, uh, this was imaged underneath after we cleaned off a layer of glycocalyx. And for reasons that we're not sure, the quartz supported very thick glycocalyx layers. Underneath the glycocalyx, that quartz surface has been roughened. There's etch pits starting to occur. And quartz is starting to dissolve. Now, this was a clean quartz without any kind of iron on it. We repeated the experiment and actually just got it back uh, in the past few weeks uh, with a, the same type of quartz coated with iron. And in this case, take your eye sort of takes a minute to uh, custom itself to this, but the whole surface of that quartz is covered with microorganisms. And by putting in the ferric iron, all of a sudden it's supporting a thick colony of microorganisms. There seem to be two types. We think that this is Geobacter, these little, these big guys here, and then all the rest of these little guys all around here are Geothrix, both of them iron reducers. And then they're actually forming quite thick colonies with all sorts of glycocalyx. So you add iron to the system, and all of a sudden, the microorganisms take advantage of that and really start to take off. Microcline, microcline's a little bit more dramatic. 
starting microcline surface. And this is about what a microcline surface from the actual native aquifer material looks like, virtually undissolved, even in the contaminant, or, or I mean in the uncontaminated area, sorry. In the contaminant area, this is a microcosm after a year, and that, mi that microcline surface is completely dissolving away. Thick or deep, continuous etch pits, microorganisms all over the surface. They're a little bit deflated. It's hard to see them here because of the preparation technique. Um, but microorganisms, deep etching, not a lot of clay precipitation, not a lot of glycocalyx. Not sure why, but clearly that microcline is dissolving. Now, we've looked at two types of microcline. One was a white microcline, and I'm not sure where it was from. I can't remember now. And one a pink microcline. The white microcline looks like this after a year. The pink microcline looks like this after a year. The white microcline has about 0.15% phosphorus. The pink microcline has no phosphorus at all. And the white microcline was the only one that was colonized. And where it was colonized, this microorganism right here, you can see these little attachment filaments on it. And underneath, you can see it, the microcline is dissolving. So where there's a mineral that has a nutrient of value, it is colonized. Where it is colonized, it is dissolving. When it's dissolving, it's releasing the nutrient, and then that's pr uh, supporting the microorganisms. Now, after eight or nine months of uh, looking at that particular surface, we uh, accidentally knocked it off the, mic uh, the SEM stub and had to remount it. And how typically how science works is we accidentally remounted it backwards. On the back side, we didn't find dissolution. We actually found all kinds of precipitation. No microorganisms, no weathering, no etching of the mineral surface, but all this clay precipitating out. Now, I'm not a, a clay guy, but we have lots of clay gurus in my department, and they have burned the appropriate incense and have reached the uh, conclusion that this is probably a smectite. And it looks like this is where all that magnesium is going. It's precipitating out as a smectite. Uh, now, the picture on the right is uh, a material that has a sort of similar morphology, and it's also reported to be a smectite, or at least some people believe it's a smectite. It looks kind of the same. Uh, that, this one on the right, I didn't take this micrograph. This is from the, uh, that Martian meteorite. No comment. <laughs> uh, anorthoclase, a sodium-potassium feldspar. This is about a cl as close as we came to something that you might call a biofilm. A biofilm is actually not very common. It's mostly very sparse populations of microorganisms, not colonies. It's individual organisms. But on the anorthoclase, it actually supported a, quite a few microorganisms. We only found one type, diplococcus. And you can see the diplococcus here, this 2 coxy. Um, and uh, we never found diplococcus anywhere else. Where the diplococcus was colonizing, the mineral surface is uh, weathering away. And in this case, the clay doesn't precipitate on the mineral surface. It, appear, it appears to be precipitating on the microorganism itself. This is the only time we saw this was on Diplococcus. You can see all this wispy clay material. And again, the clay gurus have looked at this. And, and this is a little bit different micrograph. This is an environmental SEM. And I don't know how many of you have, have seen pictures from this. But an environmental SEM, uh, the, the, the sample's wet. And actually, you can uh, image live microbes. Well, they're not live for very long because you're zapping them with 30 keV of electrons. But uh, for that brief instant that they're moving around, uh, they're hydrated. And so you can see this uh, clay. And again, the clay guys have looked at this, and they've decided that it's either a haloisite or smectite. Um, and again, anorthoclase was the one other mineral that we've looked at that had a whole lot of phosphorus. This had actually about 0.18% phosphorus, which is a pretty phenomenal amount. Albite. Albite was uncolonized, unweathered, and there was no clay precipitate. Olivine, which should have been the thing to dissolve, was uncolonized, unweathered, and no clay precipitate, and neither one of these things had any uh, phosphorus in it. So we reached the obvious conclusion, grant renewal. Uh, I sent this to, I sent this to uh, NSF, and I guess they just had a real laugh about it, and I've heard that they have a 
overhead that they use in their road shows. They go around to different universities and talk about grant getting and they throw this overhead up. Um, but what we found was this a linked system. We found that microorganisms were controlling the geochemistry and the mineral chemistry was controlling the microorganisms. Microorganisms are starved for nutrient and they're going out and finding it. They're finding it by dissolving the silicates, releasing the nutrient, and using that as a, to gain an advantage in that particular uh, niche, in that particular environment. So here would be a proposed weathering reaction. Uh, benzene, carbonate rocks, ferric iron, produces dissolved magnesium, dissolved iron, dissolved calcium, pre precipitates some calcite, and then uh, produces these microbial ligands. Here's one of these microbial ligands that we've identified at the site, 3,4-dihydroxybenzoic uh, acid, and this is a, a siderophore, a uh, low affinity siderophore, actually. Microcline, magnesium, a little bit of proton, precipitating out of smectite. This is where the magnesium is going, releasing phosphorus and releasing dissolved silica. And then the phosphorus is taken up by the microorganism. So here's my model of the silicate surface. Microorganism is uh, moving through the aquifer and will attach to a surface. Most microorganisms want to be on the surface. There's some exceptions to that rule, but it's a good rule of thumb. As that microorganism is metabolizing carbon, it's going to produce a cloud of reactive byproduct. Organic acids, ligands, siderophore, CO2, enzymes, whatever. And these are going to start reacting with the mineral surface. As it reacts with the mineral surface, it's starting to dissolve that mineral surface. Now, in the case of quartz, I don't think it gets much out of just plain quartz. I think that, it, I mean, there may be a trace of ferric iron in quartz. I think that's probably pretty stretching it. But it's a surface, and it attaches to the surface, and it dissolves it. In the case of microcline, however, as it's dissolving that surface, it's releasing phosphorus. And it's gaining a huge advantage at that particular location. So more microorganisms will be uh, produced. They're going to be dissolving that surface, and they're going to release more phosphorus. When that happens, when you have a nutrient source in a, in a system, microorganisms will move toward that nutrient, a process called chemotaxis. And so as that surface dissolves, more microorganisms will colonize it. You'll get more dissolution, more reaction. But the whole system is being controlled by the microorganism about which thing dissolves. So now the question sort of becomes, well, how important is this? Is this only important in this very small oil spill near the even smaller town of Bemidji, Minnesota, whose big claim to fame is the birthplace of Paul Bunyan? Or is this the answer to global weathering of silicates? Sort of two end members of possibilities. Uh, now, in the case of the contaminant area, where we've seen this in, in other sites, uh, I've seen it in uh, lignites, uh, I've seen it in other contaminant plumes is when the system goes very anaerobic, iron reduction, methanogenesis. I've seen a lot, when people analyze silica, the dissolved silica starts to increase. And it looks like in that environment, the microorganism can produce those, those types of siderophores that uh, they can actually regulate their concentration, build them up, and dissolve away the surface. Where in the aerobic environment, it doesn't appear that that really happens. Well, what about Global weathering. Well, to look at that, what we chose to do is look at a peat bog about 100 kilometers north of Bemidji. This offered a perfect opportunity to make a comparison. Essentially the same weather, cold. Um, same groundwater, essentially. Only this time, the system is naturally organic rich. It doesn't have any oil in it. Now, I actually don't have 26 more slides. I have about four more slides, four or five more slides. But I do have to give you a quick lesson in peatland hydrology so you don't get away scot-free. Uh, in this particular peatland, this is the Lost River Peats uh, um, near uh, Red Lake, there are more or less two kinds of wetlands. Uh, this is a lot of work that uh, Don Siegel and Paul Glazier have been working on, Don Siegel at Syracuse and Paul Glazier at Minnesota. Um, there, there's more or less two kinds of wetlands. One is a, a fen, a spring fen, and a spring fen is a, is a discharge zone. It, groundwater moves from the underlying aquifer and discharges up at the surface. If any of you have ever been in this kind of a fen, you'll recognize it immediately. 
As long as you keep moving, it's like walking on a waterbed. As soon as you stop, it's like sinking into a mire. And you'll sink up to your knees or your hips in this swamp. But as the groundwater is discharging out around you. In this particular environment, the groundwater here in the peat is uh, very organic rich. It's about neutral pH, but it's aerobic. And there's no dissolved iron, and there's no methane. If we look at the dissolved silica, and this is uh, depth here and concentration in milligram per liter of dissolved silica. And in this graph, you read it from bottom to top. That's the flow path. So dissolved silica, bottom to top, well, it doesn't really change very much. In fact, it gets a little bit lower, probably just dilution. Um, and, but it's a right around that same background concentration of silica, around 20 uh, milligram per liter. Now, the bog is a more or less a recharge zone. And the groundwater moves from top actually down and, and perhaps out the sides. Um, but it's more or less a recharge zone. In the bog, at the top of the bog, pH is very acidic. And in the last uh, round of sampling, we were just up there a few weeks ago, and it was down below pH of 4 right at the top. As you go down through the peak column, it, gets, it starts to uh, buffer up, and pH can get up around 7 or so, six, between 6 and 7. The system has very high organic carbon, a lot of organic acids. But in this case, the system is anaerobic. There's uh, dissolved iron and dissolved methane, uh, and actually a lot of methane being produced there. Now we read the dissolved silica concentration from top to bottom along the flow path. Silica starts very low, increases as you go down through the peat, passes the concentration of the background groundwater, uh, the underlying aquifer, and then continues to increase, far exceeding the solubility of quartz, acting just the same as we saw at the Bemidji site. Now, I haven't been able to recover our microcosms up there yet, so I don't have the same type of pictures. What I have looked at up there are the native um, sand grains and silk grains in the peat. Now, again, the carbonates were useless, and in fact, there aren't really any carbonates there. But the silicates seem to tell an interesting story. At the top of the bog, the horn, uh, this is an example just of a horn blend. The horn blend is essentially unweathered. It's been there about 1,000 years based on carbon dating of the peat itself. It's in the very acidic part of the bog. I mean, hey, we should be dissolving it. If we're going to dissolve it anywhere, it would be right at the top of the bog where all the acid is. And this is what horn blends look like in the fen. But if you go just a little bit deeper in the bog, and the pH is getting up around neutral, very high organic carbon, reducing conditions, and the horn blend is rapidly dissolving. If you go even deeper in the, in the bog, you don't find horn blend at all. Now, did microorganisms drill those little holes there? Oh, I'd love to be able to tell you that. But unfortunately, to get these silk greens, I had to ash the peat. Well, the microbes are history. So I can't, I don't have that same smoking gun. But it looks just like the features that we are seeing at the Bemidji site, and the same relationship between uh, anaerobic, aerobic, organic carbon, and pH, et cetera. Quartz, quartz at the top of the bog, virtually no evidence of any weathering. Quartz from the fen, no evidence anywhere in the fen, no evidence of weathering. Quartz at the bottom of the bog, remember we're completely supersaturated with respect to quartz. That's about the most weathered piece of quartz I've ever seen. Looks like little microbe holes drilled in it. Can't tell you for sure. Hopefully next year when we recover the microcosms, we'll be able to give you another answer. But uh, it sure looks like it's a microbially dissolving piece of quartz. And engineer friends of mine who have looked at this said, well, that sure looks like biocorrosion. OK. So the answer to global weathering, right? Microbes drilling little holes and tunnels, making porosity moving oil bodies around, et cetera. Well, maybe. Microorganisms are certainly everywhere. Uh, they've been found at very deep uh, depths. They're alive at very deep depths. Are they uh, dissolving all the silicates? Well, in some aquifers, it seems like it might be an important process. Contaminated systems, <coughs> seems like. Reducing aquifers, lignitic. Uh, uh, confined aquifers, a lot of the aquifers in East Texas, for example, a lot of methane, a lot of dissolved iron. Uh, wetlands, swamps, uh, marine sediments that are organic.